Right. Tiny little bit of history as far as I know it uh, first. History is just about our interpretation of the tiny little bits that we know and, and we don't know much about the history of spoons. Uh, they've been around like forever for cooking, ladles and that sort of thing. Um, we probably use shells and gourds and anything that we could scoop food up with. Uh, but as far as artifacts, historical artifacts are concerned, spoons seem to be a fairly modern invention. If we go back to, uh, where the hell was it? Um, the big archery do over in France. Agincourt, thank you very much. I went to a, a medieval banquet once um, in the Undercroft at Warwick Castle and they try to get everything in theme, in, in, in the year or true to the, the time. And the meal was served up on a, a wooden platter with a gravy groove around the outside, a bowl of pottage, half a loaf of bread and a piece of meat. And allowing for the fact that when I went there most people didn't carry knives but <coughs> back at the when this would have been relevant everybody would have had their knife with them they gave us a knife whoops <coughs> and that was the meal so everybody was sitting around looking at the piece of meat uh, looking at the bowl of pottage no fork no spoon just a knife how on earth do you eat it and of course modern man was sort of sitting there twiddling his thumbs and then somebody came along and showed us that you <coughs> break the bread you take the middle out and you dop it in your pottage and you use that for soaking up the pottage you use your fingers for the meat you tear it off or you bite it off straight away and then the gravy that you've got in the bottom here's your spoon you use the <coughs> the crust as a spoon to scoop that out and eat it that way so there wasn't a spoon Come forward about a hundred years and the Mary Rose went down, thankfully, because when they brought her up they found the captain had got, or the captain and the ship's doctors had got um, some silver measuring spoons which were almost certainly for ceremonial or for measuring purposes, but we also found two wooden spoons, the first wooden spoons we have artifacts of and they're horrible to use, they're just little bowls on sticks. We got the, the Mary Rose bowls came up that the sailors had and each sailor had his bowl with his mark on it. And we're lucky that we got two of these because when you got a spoon, it was your spoon and it went everywhere with you. Like your knife, it went everywhere with you. So if you went overboard, your spoon and your knife went with you and the sharks got you. But luckily those two came up. They were made out of field maple and one of them was carved out of the wood oh, use that that way the rings of the, the wood going around so and the other one was carved out that way and we can tell that from obviously from the ring patterns on the, the wood the problem with carving one out of the edge around here is that the wood shrinks that way so if you have that wood shrinking there it's pulling the end apart and one of these the one that was carved out of that way it's got a little crack in the edge exactly as it should have because the wood shrunk and it's pulled the end apart but of course they were making the most use of the wedge of wood that they took out of the tree and one came out that way and one came out the other way so our first wooden spoons for eating came up with the mary rose courtesy of the lovely mary rose um, <coughs> from there on the sailors took the spoons home with them and people at home started to then use spoons because dad came home with a spoon in his pocket and they caught on from that point on. So wooden spoons or eating spoons really are a fairly modern invention, um, utilisation. So today we're here and we're going to make one. Why carve a wooden spoon? 
When you look at the thing, it curves all over the place. It's not just a flat. Even that one's not flat. But your, your cooking spoons are typically just a flat piece of wood with a gouge pulled out of it. <coughs> but the eating spoon, it's got a crook in the handle, so that as you're holding it, as you would normally, the bowl is flat to you. So to get that, it's actually got to be crooked up. If you have a bowl that is dead flat, then, well, you, you can't get it into the bowl because it's, it's flat. You know, you're up at an angle and if you try and scoop it out, as it comes out, everything's running off before you manage to get it out there. So it's a, it's a three-dimensional shape and that means that the grain in that wood is going all over the wood. The grain can be straight, but where you're cutting, you're cutting here, the grain's coming out. You're cutting there, the grain's coming out that way. You're cutting on the back, the grain's going that way and that way. On the bowl, it, the grain's going everywhere. So if you can master carving a spoon, you can carve anything. So it's just a, a damn good apprentice's uh, challenge. If you can do that, then literally you're on your way to being able to carve anything. And the anything could be a mega crochet hook a knitting needle, a tent peg, anything you like. Once you get into the mentality of, I can do that, I can carve one of those, all you need is the tools, the techniques, and some timber. So without any more ado, we'll set to to carving. <coughs> that, the axe, has been with us probably that we've been here. Um, I read recently that they think that seven sisters stood out or stepped out onto this planet some 220, 240,000 years ago <coughs> and we've all come from them. But when they did come onto the planet, we were pop the planet was populated with Neanderthals and Neanderthals were brilliant at making axes, flint axes. So we were sort of born into a world where this was a tool that was on the go anyway. Um, so we've been, it's been part of us for all of our lives, all of our existence. That part of us, I think, goes a long way to explaining why using the tool is something that is very enjoyable to us. Anyway, so to get into this, when you cut a piece of timber, either with an axe or with a bit of modern technology like that, it'll always crack. <coughs> nearly always crack unless it's a piece of something like eucalyptus and that's got grain that goes so many different ways that don't go don't go to eucalyptus so cracks there already we'll open it up For safety that axe will go through you it can go through wood it's going to go through you quite easily so we don't want the axe flying out of the piece of wood into your leg, into your hand or anywhere else. So we've split the wood down there, the grain in that wood runs up and down the tree, it runs around the outside and when it shrinks, as I said earlier on, it likes to shrink this way. It doesn't shrink very much that way, it also doesn't shrink very much that way. So we're going to carve our spoon out of that wedge there. Uh, yep, we'll take it out of there. We're going to make a wedge. And that's going to become our spoon. As it stands, it's too thick on one edge and it's too thin on the other. So we've got to take off. Jeff, why did you give me a pitch that's got a wobble on it. <laughs> so we're going to take off that edge and we're going to take off that thick piece. When you're using the axe it's brilliant at cutting through the grain. A little narrow edge like that is not very good at splitting. Although I've used it there for splitting it's not ideal because it tends to cut into the wood and follow it where you're making it go rather than where the grain goes. So we'll utilise the fact that it's got a pound of steel there to cut into the grain 
and weaken it and then we can clean that off easily. So chop, 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 chop and then clean it down. The axe is tending to do one direction, one dimension all the time. with the chopper. That's about where we're going to start off with. So we've gone from a tree to a billy. Now just so that you can see where I'm carving, roughly the shape we're going to be going for and again it's the axe 80% or so of the, the carving is done with the axe again if I'm going to carve this wood out here or there I'm going to chop in to cut the grains and then clear it through got a handy divot there out of my chopping block so I can park the edge of this in so that I can into it. Now, if I get too high up here, I'm putting my hand at risk, and also a lot of the force is coming out into my hand. So I've got another handy little shelf down here where I can whack away at it, and the force is going into the piece of wood rather than into my hand. You see what I mean about getting more precision if you're used to just doing that? you're much more likely to be precise in your cutting rather than if you're going all over the place. If this was fully seasoned wood, I wouldn't be able to go at this speed. Now at this point, the handle's tapered from the thick end here up towards the neck there. So if I try to cut in there, I'm going into the grain and the wood's likely to split up towards the handle. So I've actually got to carve that, this handle, that way. And I can only do so much carving up here because I'm more than about two thirds of the way up the, uh, the piece of wood and I'll put my finger on the wrist. So to do that piece, this doesn't have to be used as an axe in that respect. It's sharp enough that we can actually use it as a guillotine. Cutting back along the grain there. Let's go. 
yard that wood, the side of the spoon will fall off. So I've got to be very careful cutting in there. You see how my hand has gone from there, where I was swinging it to cut the big cuts, up to there. It shades off, if you're going to point at something, you've got quite a lot of accuracy. Here, I've got less accuracy because there's more possibility of movement there from where my hand wants something to go. There, that's even longer, and this thing, the amount of accuracy you've got on the end there is way, way down. So by sliding my hand right up around the uh, plate itself, I'm more precise about those cuts. By putting a cut that way in the top end here, I can make sure that the end because I'm putting some wallops in on this to try and cut through this end piece here. starting to look like a spoon that you saw on the television by the lady that was fed up with society and was sitting on a chemical closet in the woods carving wooden spoons. Ouch. It's an ugly looking thing at the moment, but it's a thing of beauty inside there somewhere. about it for that dimension. Now onto the side we'll, we'll mark out the, the third dimension. piece of the end, the back of the spoon, we're going to leave on right to the end because if I carve that off first and then I start carving the inside of the bowl, that's a very weak point in, in the wet wood and if I'm carving away here I'm likely to just snap that end straight off. So I'll leave that thick to the very last moment and at the moment I'll carve out the back of the handle, the dip along the front of the handle and the the dip of the bowl itself. Same technique, except now this wood's a lot thinner and we can be a lot more gentle in cutting it, otherwise we like to cut straight through it. Exactly the same technique, using the weight of that steel head to cut through the grains. <coughs> 
and then clear the, the chips off. Now, coming up here, the grain wants to split straight into the back of the spoon, so I can only carve so far. If I make a split run up there, the back of the spoon will go. So, so far up, and then stop it with cuts coming from the opposite direction. So we've got a bit of a bend on the back of the spoon now. The top of the handle goes round. <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> it's deadly <definitely> serious. <laughs> with an axe but you can. Lay it flat on the chopper, on the chopping block and just chop it straight across. There's one risk and that is that the blade will not cut in but it will scoop out instead and it will take my knuckles off. At this point you can see these sorts of cuts. If that tip wasn't protected and supported by that, it would just snap straight off. Right, not far off, ugly as sin. with that piece on the back there. with it. And I'm only going to take it so far because yet again if I come out the back here I'll just break the back of the spoon off. get a group of people carving spoons, mostly the only thing you can hear is chit 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 we're all pecking away, not wanting to overdo it and ruin the work that you've got done so far. So, from tree trunk to spoon outline, very roughly outline, with the axe. Next knife, or next is uh, the little carving knife, the little uh, craft knife. I use the Mora knife. You could use a five pound cheapie out of Tesco's, so long as it's fairly small, fairly thin, and it'll take a good edge. The nice thing about these is they're laminated steel. The hard steel in the middle will take an edge and keep it for ages. And then you've got the support of the uh, tough steel around the outside. Using it, it's 
going to go through them. It's not even going to blink. If you have got control of that, and you let that near that, you're going to have claret all over the place. So the cuts that you're going to use have to be cuts that are under control. The old business, yeah, okay, when it flies out of the wood, there's nothing hopefully out there, so it's not going to hit anything. And you're, they're always saying, never carve towards yourself, because obviously you can get in the way of that flying out of the wood. The way to use it is to keep it under control all the time, so that you're not pushing with these muscles here against the piece of wood, and then when it comes out of the wood, you've got all the elasticity in all these muscles, and it's, you can't stop it, because the moment its resistance is gone, it's flying away. The technique to use it is leverage. Put it against the wood, and lever it against another muscle, a finger, rotate the, the knife in the palm of the hands against your thumb. It's all a matter of counterbalancing the force that you're putting on against the other. So the actual degree of force is tiny, but it's under your control. Now, Again, there's, there's no muscle um, elasticity there, it's just a little bit of uh, elasticity in your thumb, basically, that you're going to be using. Now, the most popular one is the one that defies all the rules. Never cut the rules out, because that's exactly what we're going to do now. Now, brace the, the spoon against the sternum. I'm going to use those fingers there as my lever backstop. Back of the blade against those fingers, and then rotate again with my elbow. So even though I'm cutting towards myself, there's nothing, there's no memory afterwards. When the cut stops, it can't go anywhere because the force is coming from those fingers. So I can make very fine cuts. And the nice thing about that blade is that I can make rotational cuts. So not only am I pushing it forwards. I can slide it through the wood and I can rotate it so that it can follow that curve there without any problems at all. A slicing cut lets it come through there easily and you can take those nasty old axe marks off. So spoon carving then turns into sort of a ballet of how to hold it, the spoon, how to hold the knife, how to cut, where to cut, following the grain, the grain keeps going round and round and round and round. So when you're watching somebody carving a spoon, they're forever turning and dancing around and coming in a different way, a different way, back that way. placing my hand in the right place, my knuckles are being pushed by those fingers and my fingers here are doing the rotational bit to cut in there and I'm safe, it's not going to go anywhere, it's not going to fly out of the wood at the end of the cut when the wood lets go. I'd like to take that piece off and I'd like to go that way but I can't because the grain's coming out at me. There is a way that I can do it is to come across the grain and take it off going across the grain. So we're starting to get a nice spoon shape. The knob there you can carve that down with a chest cut. That's 
braced firmly against my chest and what I'm doing is I'm drawing the knife through the wood but when it comes out of the wood it isn't going anywhere because it's actually braced against me right that just about the only way I can get it because here the grain's going forward and yet I've got to cut towards me is to slide the blade through the wood. Even though I'm cutting up into the grain I can still cut it because I'm sliding the knife into the wood. give a bit more strength to the edge of the spoon. Only about a millimetre. is always easy when you're cutting the wood across the grain. It's not fighting you at all. It's important you keep that thumb below the edge of the wood because as it comes off the back edge and slips off, you don't want your thumb to be there. Another thing to watch out for is if you come off this back edge, if you haven't got the chamfer cut, that edge is very fragile and it can just snap straight off. Now at that point, the grain's coming out the top of the spoon so I've got to turn around and even though I look, it looks as if I'm cutting back into the grain which I am I'm actually cutting with the grain that way okay starting to be a bit spoon shaped now we've got the back of the spoon and it's always the hardest bit because here we've got grain going that way that way that way that way we can come in here on these hard corners using the, the fingers and the knuckles and carve in with a, a rotation and a slide. Nibbling away at it, both sides. Now that transition where the handle goes into the spoon, it's an absolute heartbreak where if you haven't got enough meat here to translate, translate from the handle into the bowl of the spoon, it will just snap off straight through there and you're left with a stick at the front end of the spoon. Not nice for that to happen at all when you've spent hours and hours and hours carving your, your wonderful piece of wood and it breaks off there. So to overcome that, although it might be narrow there, you make it wide there. And then that width translates into the back of the spoon and spreads out across the bowl. And once you've got to about halfway up the spoon with that width, then you can be as thin as you like around the top edge because you've got the forces then into the bowl. It's a bit like an egg. It's very strong once you've got into the round of the thing. Now taking off the sides, a thumb push, a rotate of the hand, bracing it, levering it against your thumb. this the 
nightmare. Holding the spoon, which is now getting quite small, and then cutting across it to get this back off to the right level is hard. Because the grain's fighting you all the time. On the internet you'll probably see people a clamp the spoon in a, any form of vice and they'll have at it with chisels, gouges and there it is, it's there for them to hack at. Is it spoon carving? Well, it's not freehand spoon carving, put it that way. This is just using you and the knife. thin that piece of wood down quite thin when I cut it out initially. You see I'm still taking meat off the back of the spoon there. Several of the people that I've taught, they don't stop. There is a point at which you've got to say, okay, I could carry on looking at this and refining it and taking these last shavings out for the next few hours. I'm not going to. It's now time for the bowl. even smaller now, even harder to hold. And one of the favourite holds again is going to be using those fingers, holding it finger and thumb, bracing it against the palm of your hand and using the leverage here on those. Now when we get down towards the bottom of the bowl, we're bracing it into the palm of the hand. The big thing to worry about, and you need to worry about it, is when that gets thin enough, if you cut too deep, press against the palm of your hand, you're going to go straight through the bottom of the bowl, straight through the palm of your hand. Now, if I cut myself with, or when I cut myself with that, because if you start carving, you are going to cut yourself. End of fact. Cut yourself with that, stereo strip and a bit of super glue, and it will heal. Cut yourself with that at the palm of your hand. All you can do is give it to the dog. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to glue back in again and you've got a nasty hole in the palm of your hand. So special care when you get down to there. But in here the grains are going every which way, coming out back and forth and you've got to cut a, a bowl out of it. So finger and thumb, those fingers and we're going to rotate the elbow, rotate the tool cut in, cut down and pull out some some loose bits. Once we've got them out we cut across to take those out. Cutting across the spoon is nice and easy. We can cut into that shape nice and easy. The other end Brace it against your chest, 
use those fingers again and a, a rotation you definitely don't want to be putting any pressure on by pulling it towards yourself if you do that when it comes out of the wood, the springiness is there and you're going to finish up with carving yourself. So all the effort of that blade going into the wood has to be done against those fingers by rotating the tool out with your elbow and by rotating the tool with your wrist. And as you're doing it, you'll hear the sound change as you start to thin out the bottom of the bowl. I don't know if you can hear the sound changing already. It's not thin enough yet, because the light's not going through. When it's thin enough, the light will go through the wood and it will sound, sound completely different. It sounds <laughs> hollow. Don't let the bits lined up because again they can, if they get over the edge of your blade and you put the force on then they can make the blade slip and you, you've lost control. Again there you see coming across the grain making lots of lovely small smooth shavings. You can't do that if you've got a blunt blade. You will scrape the wood, you'll feather it all up, but you won't be able to cut across the grain like that. And it's, it's a lovely way of pulling that bowl out nice and gently. are made by a guy called most of you have heard of Robin Wood. He actually made that, that bowl, bowl made. He's got a knife maker in Sheffield um, that turns these blades out for him. You can actually buy the blades mounted in hand from him. But he also sells just the blades and then you can mount it in whatever handle you want. Now for my hands that handle is ideal because it gives me a good grip and it gives me the opportunity of getting that rotation. I've got another one that I bought first. For me, it's a little bit too small. So consequently you can't get this degree of control out of it. Just starting to cool. see it getting thin enough. But there, folks, is basically it. That's tools, <laughs> technique, and timber.